three people and you're going to have four weeks do something. <laughs> it started out of pure stubbornness, which is great. <laughs> Without necessarily meaning to, I think we found this quite interesting niche. No, we did some stuff and the fact that it's invisible means it works. <laughs> I think art is encoded knowledge and uh, experience. At that time, we were really fascinated by the whole transmedia concept. That was it, not the time-travelling robot idea that we had. Hello and welcome to Technique. I am Sam Fry and this is the podcast where we speak to artists about technology. Today's episode is on the topic of materials. Specifically, it features an interview with my co-host, Richard F. Adams, who speaks with material scientist, comedian, and soon-to-be author, Anna Pashaisky. Anna is actually a host of her own podcast called Real Talk, in which she speaks to people about materials, making, crafting, and doing. I actually met her a couple of years ago when we were sharing tips on podcasting in a coffee shop near where she works at University College London. Anna's podcast is a great informal conversation with all kinds of material makers. So if you like the sound of the interview today, you should also check out The Real Talk podcast. In terms of this episode, Anna and Richard talk about a variety of making and materials-based topics, including material science, the properties of slime, access to knowledge, recycling plastics, and the need for a society that reuses materials. The episode is a little bit longer than usual, but it's full of fascinating insights and a few facts along the way. So, here we go, into the interview. I should say that Richard and Anna start their discussion by promoting an event that unfortunately just happened, but they use it to talk about the kind of work that Anna and the team at UCL do. Here we go. Hello and welcome to Technique. Today I'm interviewing and talking to Dr. Anna Pozhajski. Yay! <laughs> who works at the Institute of Making in UCL in central London, which is a, a terrific facility, and I'd recommend actually looking them up on the website and actually popping down and seeing them and coming here and making something, because as a gathering, it's open to the public, is that right? Yeah, we open to the public three days a year for our public open days. The next one's on the 26th of October, if this is going out before then. Just um, about. Come on down, that theme is Gases. So we're going to be exploring the materiality of gases. And day to day, we're here for the staff and students of UCL to come and explore materials and making processes. For the benefit of the listener, we're actually sitting in the Institute of Making right now, recording this. The half that we're sitting in is called the Materials Library. And so we're surrounded by shelves and stacks and drawers and jars full of different materials. And when you walk into the make space, you're just assaulted by this huge range of objects. And we've got everything from welly boots to animal horns to bricks to rubber gloves to plastic trumpets, wooden chair legs and absolutely everything else that you can imagine. I mean, Um, behind you, there's a whole rack of jars. It's like an apothecary from Dickens. Exactly. Or, like, uh, I mean, in fact, we were sat where, we are just off Gower Street in central London, and there used to be a a dry salter not far away where I used to, by the TUC house down by the British Museum. Oh, right. That used to sell paints, pigments, media, etc. I don't know if it's still there. Brilliant. It reminds me very much of that. Yes. The idea of this part of the Institute of Making is that you can take any object off the shelves and you can squeeze it, you can smell it, you can try and twist it or bounce it on the floor, whatever you think the interesting material materiality of that thing is, you can have a play with it. And by doing that, you learn about materials properties and what objects are made of and how that makes them behave. But that's only one side of materials. All of these materials that we're surrounded by have also come to being because they've been put through some making processes. Some of those might be biological processes, like the horns, like the honey combs, or they could be man-made processes, like extrusion or 3D printing, like we've mentioned, 
or they might have been sewn together or cast or forged. There's all these different making processes and the objects here are the result of those. Now you can sit and look at an object and you might be able to work out how it might have been made. We've got some aluminium foam just opposite me there and so you think, well, how do they make aluminium foam? Or we've got a human hairbrush, which is a brush made of human hair. How's that grown? Well, it's grown on a head and then it's cut off. All of these different objects tell a story. And as material scientists, we often are sort of a bit forensic about an object that we have in our hands. How has that come to be? And so this part of the materials library is really about exploring those possibilities. Now, this is kind of actually the end of all these objects interesting making lives because they've all the objects have been made and then that's how they are in the other half of the institute making we've got our workshop and that's where people can come and actually explore those processes themselves and transform materials from something into something else and we have dedicated members of staff technicians here that work whose sole aim is to help people realize what they've got in their heads using making processes interestingly what you've said there you you've pulled together making as being things that grow organically as well as things that are fabricated. Absolutely. We've got no hierarchy here in terms of the processes, but all the materials. And so when you walk in, you'll see a huge array of different things, but there's no apparent order to it. And that's the point. There's no hierarchy here. So a wax candle is just as important as a titanium hip implant. Right? Both of those are just as interesting to us in terms of their materials and how they've been made. So when you, when you start making and when you look at working in making, and I'm using the inverted commas <laughs> around the thing, but when you work in that world, presumably then most people who come into that have some understanding of material science. That's not a prerequisite to coming here and learning. So the Institute was set up, it first evolved from this materials library by, by the three founders. And um, the, the purpose is that anyone can come and UCL is an academic institution, so we have people here who, who are studying any array of academic subjects, historians, architects, engineers, physicists, biologists, medics, people from across that wide range of academic study, and they all come at it from their own perspective. Sometimes the things that they make here are related to their course, and so it's a course requirement for engineering, for example, that they have to do a project and make something as part of that. Some people come here because they'd love to learn how to do pottery on a potter's wheel, or they'd love to learn how to use a sewing machine to fix their clothes. So it can be academic work here, but it can also just be pet projects and fun and learning. Yeah, so that, that's a hell of a range of things to do, though. I mean, the, <laughs> yeah. you know, certainly my experience at art school, we had paint, we had sculptural materials, printing, photography, but this somehow seems a lot more. Yes, yeah, I mean, we're very wide-ranging in, in the range of materials and making processes that we can do, and that's the purpose of it. And again, there's no hierarchy, so the metalwork isn't held in a higher esteem than the woodwork or the pottery or the 3D printing or the laser cutting or the embroidery. It's all given an equal playing field, and because it's an open, a physically open space, that enables conversations and collaborations between people and people make friends here that they wouldn't otherwise have met collaboration is an interesting point because obviously it's a it's very much a buzzword at the minute um but actually there's a it seems to me there's a reality in in creatives and scientists needing to collaborate more because the world is becoming much more technical scientific and complex Mm. So how do you sort of go about encouraging that? Or does it just sort of emerge from the activities? It does emerge from the activities often organically. We also have external makers that come in and do workshops on like specific making processes. I took part in a paper making workshop recently. We've had flint napping, we've had steam bending wood, all, all sorts of making processes. The collaboration side is very much kind of left to the members. We allow them this space to play and this space to have conversations. And the technicians are also able to make connections between people. If someone said, oh, I'm looking to talk to a physicist about this interesting geometrical structure that I've made in my biology lab or in my 
art because we get to know the members it's then possible for us to make those connections for people as well you use the word members mm. why is that so to become a member of the institute you have to do an induction and we run those quite a few times a year and that's basically where we come and introduce people to the workshop tools so that they are able to use them safely and it's also a way for us to give it a sort of club atmosphere so this place is described as a research club like you a can different in, yeah, feel. Yeah. It's a different feel from a lab or... Workshop. A workshop yeah. even. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and it's it, hopefully then it's inclusive and we want everybody to feel like they are able to come here and kind of have fun with things. So speaking of fun, I mean, what are some of the funniest sort of things people have done? Because <laughs> I can imagine there's some incredibly serious work going off, obviously. At but times, there must be yeah. things that come out that you just can't help but laugh at. <laughs> One of the brilliant things that we've done in recent years was our Slime Open Day. Yeah. So my colleague Sarah Brower, who runs our events programme, it was her inspiration was to do a whole public open day based on slime. And so as part of that, we wanted to test the materials properties of slime. And so we developed the Slime Olympics, where you could try and develop the stretchiest slime and see which slime would stretch the longest between people or the runniest slime or the gloopiest or the fluffiest and so we developed all of these materials testing processes and different formulae for making the slime and that was a really really fun way of examining making processes and materials testing but using quite a funny and fun yeah, it is a fun, isn't material. it? You can't help but pick the stuff up and play <laughs> with it. I mean, yeah. this is the beauty of it. It's incredibly tactile. Yes. And, you know, I mean, I've never seen any art made of it, obviously, because it wouldn't last, but it's an incredible sort of feeling. And I've, I've often wondered about, you know, sculpturally what could be done with stuff like that if mm. you took it a step further. Yeah. But, of course, it wouldn't stay up. No. Well, slime has this amazing yeah. property called sheer thinning or sheer thickening. It's thixotropic. <laughs> well, that clears it, that. it up, doesn't it? Uh, <laughs> so it has this property. <laughs> and people, people might kind of... It's easier if I explain what it is. So when you pick up a piece of slime, it can feel quite solid in your hand at first. And then as it sits there, it starts to creep in between your fingers and creep down onto the floor. And this is a really interesting materials property whereby the speed at which it moves will dictate how viscous it is so whether it's like really thick treacle or really runny honey and so that's actually a very like technical process and there's lots of implications of that blood for example is a shear thinning liquid and oh. without shear thinning of, lo- of blood we wouldn't be able to vive probably because it has to stay thin yeah exactly to flow through and so there's i mean there's many many examples of these types of fluids you know engineers need to understand shear thinning when they're designing engines and and fluid dynamics and flowing liquids around you can imagine lots of different examples of that where that would be important but slime is a fun fun way to discuss well one other fun thing i've seen and you know i'm going to ask you about it is black paint oh yeah (laughs) i recently saw this car that was painted with the blackest black Mm. paint and literally your eyes just couldn't stay on it amazing i mean how does that work so this is, it's a very, very interesting nanomaterial, actually. Yeah. So you might have heard of Vanta Black. Yes. That's one of, is it a trademarked name? It is actually, trademarked, yeah. Yeah, so it stands for Vertically Aligned Nanotube Array, Vanta. And so these are, like, nanoscale, so way, way smaller than the eye can see, tubes of carbon, and they're all vertically aligned. So if you imagine, like, a, a grassy lawn, like, those are all vertically aligned pieces of grass. Very similar to that, but at the nanoscale, made of carbon. And... When they vertically align on a flat surface, or even a curved surface, actually, I think, the way that the light interacts with that, all of the light gets sucked in and it can't get... There's a lot less reflect- reflect- reflectivity, or whatever exactly, the word yeah. is, yeah. Yeah, so this is, this is a very special... It's not actually a pigment, it's structural. So a carbon nanotube, I'm going to argue, isn't black, actually. The, the reason that you see it as black is that the structure of all those nanotubes together is what traps the light. I think a lot of artists would get that, and designers in particular, because when you're working with screens and colours, 
you know, what you soon realise is that black is an absence of light, and white is all the light. Exactly. It's not at neither are colours. No, no, exactly, exactly <clears> that. You know, they're not hues, they're not on the colour wheel. And so do you learn that when you're mixing paints? Uh, people that... like me do, because I'm obsessive about how things work. But, yeah, um, uh, yeah I mean, well, it, it's become more important on screens. Mm. When you're producing digital things, it becomes very... It's light versus dark rather than hue. Yeah, and on screens you put yeah. numbers to that, right? Yeah, so you can describe it in a number, so you just no, 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 six notes. Yes, would be black. Yeah. yeah, yeah, interesting. And actually, in that case, you know, you might just get no light at all coming mm. out of the little LED dot. Right. So there is no light, so it is therefore no colour. It is mm. the absence of. Yeah. Which is a similar thing, but we haven't seen that, have we, with materials as such until recently. And well, this, is the, this is the breakthrough with the carbon nanotubes in that you're producing something that actually just doesn't let any light escape, therefore there's no light, no colour. Definitely. But what we've just described is called structural colour. So like we said, the structure of it is what gives it the black colour, sort of inverted commas colour. Well, it emerges Absence. from the structure, yeah. yeah. It's a property um, of the structure. Exactly. Yeah. But there are other structures that have the property of letting colours through. So, And these arise in nature. So the morpho butterfly has actually brown wings. The, the materials themselves are brown, but they're structured in a way that blue light is reflected. So the butterflies look blue, but if you actually, like, scrunch them up in a metal and... No, the blue disappears. In a mortar yeah, and pestle, yeah. yeah. The blue disappear and they just be brown. Poor little butterfly. I know, you shouldn't really do that to butterflies. <laughs> but. No, but that is interesting, that you've got all those properties. And, and I wonder... See, to me, the, the sort of collision of art and science that's happening now is only going to get bigger, more intense, more complex, mm. and much more usable yeah. in the future. And there are all these properties of things that I think people... I sometimes wonder, what would you do if, if Picasso got hold of that? Mm. What would he have done with it? Because he was able to change the nature of painting on two dimensions completely. Mm. So what would he do with a colour that worked? Now, I think Anish Kapoor has used some very, very... Did he use a black? Was it Vanta Black? I think his was Vanta Black. I forget which way round it is. Was it him that patented it and didn't allow anyone else I to use it? I think it might be, yeah. Or did he respond to someone else doing that and then he made the pinkest pink and patented that? Oh, I think, I think maybe he did I that. Think it was, yeah, yeah, I think yeah. that was right. But all of this collaboration and this sharing of knowledge between art and science all relies on communication, mm. which is challenging when we educate our artists and scientists almost from the beginning and that's institutional you know we have physics departments and art departments that are completely separate and we separate these two halves of knowledge which is just arbitrary really and that's a real problem and it makes it difficult for us to be able to talk to each other well, that's the physical example of that yeah. knowledge being separated but where we, where we communicate science is through scientific papers. So we'll do experiments in the lab, we'll write up a paper, it might be eight or ten pages long, and we'll then publish that. And that's only available to people who are academics. Usually it's behind a paywall. So an interested public or even people working in industry in the field don't have access to that information, which I think is bullshit, <laughs> sorry, quite frankly. I totally agree it's bullshit, especially if it's funded. Exactly, especially if it's, if it's private funded. research. It's private research. Yeah, so that's that's yeah. different. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but when it's publicly funded and when it's happening in universities, everybody should have the right to that information. I agree. We also write it in a language that is impenetrable unless you've been privy to that education. By which I mean, if, let's take the example of physics. You need to have been given a physics education for however many years, from undergrad to postgrad to be able to access that knowledge, which again is stupid because that means that an artist can't decipher what's going on in science when actually that could be a really amazing thing that they could share. Well, I think, I think that's proving to be the case with um, things like uh, data visualisation, which is a big booming industry, yeah. where actually I think even the hardcore numbers businesses are realising that somebody who can creatively display things... Mm is actually valuable because that in itself communicates with a wider audience. Yeah. If they draw a beautiful diagram that represents it, mm. you've got something that people can take in and you can take in fast, complex information that way. Yeah. I mean, you do other things to communicate. You do 
stand up. Mm, yeah. Tell me what the stand <laughs> what on earth are you doing doing stand up about wood? <laughs> <laughs> it has been done. So I got involved in this probably about five or six years ago now. My friend Steve Cross used to be head of public engagement here and he started a comedy night called Bright Club, which the idea of it was to train up academics either engineers or historians or whatever their discipline, with basic stand-up comedy skills, joke-writing skills, and then put on a comedy night where all these people would come and they would deliver nine minutes of stand-up comedy about their research, about their science, about their engineering, about their history. And so I got involved in that and I did nine minutes of stand-up on hydrogen storage materials. (laughs) (laughs) How silent was the auditorium? (laughs) Actually, well, it's in a pub rather than an auditorium, so the idea, it should mimic as much as possible an actual comedy club, and that allows your audience to be comfortable and, in inverted commas, normal people, (laughs) normal members of the public, not just your lab or your department. You know, we want... You want anybody to be able to come in and Anybody to be able to come and enjoy it, yeah. It's entertainment, it's just based on this as a subject. Exactly, yeah, rather than talking about your boyfriends or your sex Usually boyfriends, girlfriends, isn't it? Um, Actually, why not talk about hydrogen storage materials? Why not talk about Henry VIII? Why not talk about structural colouring and butterflies? And make jokes about that. I bet jokes about explosives go down a bomb, though. Eh? <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> He's a natural. <laughs> so I got involved in that a few years ago, and what it taught me was about communication and understanding audiences. Mm. And that's a valuable life lesson for anyone to know, whatever their career trajectory or passions. It's really good to be able to just understand who you're talking to. And so, yes, you learn how to write jokes, but you also learn about delivery and body language and... But also responding to an audience, because if, an audience, if, it's, if things aren't landing... Yes. You know, jokes aren't landing. I mean, what do you do? Well, an, a more advanced comedian would test out an audience. And lot, you'll see a lot of MCs doing this, so at the start of the night, the MC would try some dirty jokes and see if the audience are into that. And if they're into that, then they'll go, run go down it. that yeah, route. Yeah, yeah. If they're not so into that, actually, if, if they're not laughing at those kind of jokes, then you might want to try something more intellectual or more storytelling, longer-form stuff. If they're not liking that, you might try some one-liners. So you'll see professional comedians feel out the audience much better. But that's a hard skill to do because that's a two-way process and you're constantly speaking and listening to the audience. And that's But hard. those are the comedians typically who are doing it every night. Uh, exactly, yeah. yeah. I would not put myself in that calibre of comedian. <laughs> but I've learned a lot through doing it. Is it stand-up comedy or is it just comedic? It, that's a good point. It's supposed to be stand-up comedy, yeah. so it's not supposed to be a best man speech that is funny. Yeah. No, 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 I just... <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. the idea is to, is to do it in a stand-up format and with stand-up content. That's the, do that's you ever make things idea. explode? I I'm have sorry, done I'm obsessed with them. Some yeah. demos that are relatively explosive. Yeah. No, as part of your comedy night. Yeah, I've done demos in the have past. You? Yeah. <laughs> That's not actually I mean, you wouldn't get a stand-up comic doing that. So that no, no. that kind of verges on the sort of science show type yeah. science communication. But I've done it in the past. It's quite fun to do that sort of thing. I quite like doing demos. What's the biggest explosion you've made? Oh, so recently I collaborated with a brilliant science communicator called Stefan Gates, who, he's called The Gastronaut, that's his brand name, and he does a lot of communicating, often kids' shows about food and the chemistry and the physics and the engineering behind food. So this is like the Heston Blumenthal approach? Yeah, but... Where you but, start to unpick some of the chemistry of food. Yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah similar kind of stuff. And we did a show at the Big Bang Fair last year, which is a massive kids' science show in Birmingham run over four days and as part of our show as the grand finale I was responsible for blowing up for exploding some balloons and one of the balloons contained oxygen one of the balloons contained hydrogen and one of the balloons contained a mixture of hydrogen and oxygen and kids at school around the age that we were performing to learn in school that for a fire you need three things the fire triangle you need oxygen you need heat and you need a fuel and so in the oxygen balloon there isn't a fuel. So it does explode because it's a gas escaping, a bit like popping any balloon. It would be a bit of a bang, but not very impressive. 
Then we go to the hydrogen balloon, and the hydrogen balloon has fuel, but it has no oxygen, apart from the oxygen that's in the air. So it's a little bit bigger, a bang, but it's still not that impressive. And then once you have the hydrogen and oxygen in the balloon, that's a really, actually, like, torso-shakingly loud explosion. (laughs) It's, like, shockingly loud. And we had ear defenders on, and, like, everyone had their fingers in their ears. So that's probably the biggest bang that I've regularly performed. One performance, I got the order wrong, and I did the biggest bang in the middle. (laughs) Got into a bit of trouble, (laughs) because... The, the narrative that we were saying is like, oh, this one, yeah. oh, now this one's going to be Small, a bit bigger. Medium, and then large, it was actually yeah. huge. <laughs> so, yeah, I think the kids were a little bit shocked with that. But. Talk to me a little bit about the future, because obviously mm. what we've said here, and we've covered quite a lot, surprisingly, I think, in a, in a short time, you know, the, there is this collision of arts and sciences that I think we can't get away from and shouldn't. Mm. But there is, I suspect, the need increasingly to get people to understand materials mm. in the way I learned what paint was. Talk to me a little bit about 3D printers and, mm. and plastics and how that's going because they are becoming quite commonplace. Yep. But then, of course, there are limits to what they can do. I mean, we hear the stories about printing chocolate and all of that sort of stuff. Mm. And I know they can deal with organic... I mean, how does a th- talk me through how it works? So, the most common type of 3D printer is one that has a, a nozzle that's guided by little robots, and that nozzle extrudes out a material. Often it's plastic, and it will, depending on what you tell it by a computer, the little robots will extrude out a little layer of, they'll sort of poo out this little layer of plastic. And then it'll move up a little notch, a small amount, and then it'll do it again and it'll extrude. So it's like laying a a row of bricks the shape of a house, and then when you come to the start, you go up one brick. Exactly. And start on again, and you literally build by adding layers. Exactly, which is why you might have heard of it as being called additive manufacturing. And so that's the most common 3D printer would extrude low melting point plastic. So the, the head of the nozzle heats up and melts the plastic. And then it extrudes, and then it quickly cools and solidifies in the shape that you've put it in. So I guess that's a really important thing. It, it has to cool before it gets round. Yes, and for so the next one. Yeah, ma- the material selection of three D printers is really, really important because what you're always relying on is a change in the material. So with plastics, it's often a solidification, and that's based on being heated. So it's melting temperature that's important. So it's heated into a liquid in the nozzle, and then it cools to a solid as you print it. Now, you can have other changes in materials properties using a similar kind of 3D printing. For example, some plastics are liquid and then you shine a UV light on them and that makes them solid. Or you could have a magnetic head that put, that puts a magnetic field on and that makes it solid. So you can choose these different ways of, of changing the material from something that's extrudable to something that's stiff and solid for your final object. And the materials actually is the main thing that's limiting 3D printers at the moment, rather than any sort of hardware or software requirements. Well, the actual hardware and the way it works and the way you design things is pretty much sorted. Very simple. It's just little tiny <coughs> motors and they're guided by computer instructions. Hmm. Yeah. So, how do you print food? Well, again, you'd need to think about your materials property that you wanted to change. So chocolate, I would assume, would be similar to plastic in that you'd heat it in the nozzle, you'd extrude it out as a liquid, and then it would solidify, and then you'd print on it. Yeah, a couple of times we've met before, I haven't haven't asked you this, Mm. but if you went to the moon, because we hear all the time about the space race at the minute, and we're talking about sending things to Mars, Mm. and we're talking about this, and always in there is... We can fabricate a dwelling from the sand on the other. And it just strikes me that when you're talking there, I think we are a little way off being able to do that, especially yeah. 800 million miles mm. away or whatever. Potentially. I mean, yeah. can you extract from rocks to produce stuff? Can you extract from sand? I mean, we get glass from sand. We do. In terms of 3D printing materials, we have a hard enough time on Earth finding good ones to use that are mm. useful to us. So I think it would be possible, but the idea of taking the resources that we need from Mars... I mean, I assume that Mars is pretty similar to Earth, so if you assume that it's like mostly iron ore, 
It looks You'd very need a red. blast furnace. Yeah, yeah it looks very red. <laughs> you need to 3D print yourself a blast furnace first. Well, this is the interesting <laughs> thing, isn't it? I, I don't, yeah. yeah, when you think about this. And yeah, it's in the news every bloody week. Sure. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't know where they're up to with that. At NASA. They must must have something on the go that's giving them in, uh, the impression they can yeah. do it. Because I, I can't, you know, you've got all the other things on there, extracting water from soil. We can't even do that in the Sahara Desert. <laughs> yeah. Let alone this. And, and this is why, in a sense, I'm interested in the future because obviously we're at a certain limit. Mm. We're at a limited stage at the moment. In a way, it feels like the first steam engines, you know, when people just started yeah. putting wheels on them and putting them on tracks mm. and with no idea that 30 years later you get massive cities <laughs> right. which a direct cause of railways Absolutely. was cities yeah. you know. one of the main conclusions of 3D printing is going to be the democratisation of making and it all comes back to making so <laughs> like today in every office if not every home we have a 2D printer that can print out the internet or print mm. out whatever you've done on your computer well 3D printers are just the object version of that and so I would envisage a future where every home or every office or every street or community has a 3D printer so that instead of buying objects off the internet and having them shipped, which uses a lot of fuel and resources, why not, for a lot of objects that we have, just email a 3D printed file and 3D print that down the road? That, to me, seems like it will solve quite a lot of issues with stuff. Well, it will reduce the amount of goods being shipped. Yeah, which For a start, which massive. if you cut just 10%, you would cut... Masses, You know, yeah. a hell of a lot. And, and always, I think, when people talk about these initiatives, we always think, oh, it's binary, either on or off. But it's not. It's about just take a slice out of this, mm. slice out of that, and suddenly, before you know it, you've reduced the whole lot absolutely, down. Absolutely, absolutely. So in order to realise <coughs> that, we're going to need to widen the range of materials available to 3D printers and really increase the quality. Well, where's that coming from? I mean, what do you mean, what sort of materials do you think? Well, at the moment, our 3D printers can print one or maybe two materials at a time. So if you imagine that you wanted to 3D print, say, a table knife, we'd want that made out of stainless steel with maybe a plastic handle or something. Those are two materials with totally different materials properties. Steel melts at 1,600 degrees, plastic melts at 200 degrees. Mm. How can we make an engineering system that can accommodate those two materials and compile them into the same object? That's a real challenge, but not actually one that I think is beyond us. Mm. That's not beyond physics, that's just engineering. And it's not that great a step then to be printing electronics. And so you could 3D print your TV remote if it breaks. You could 3D print all sorts of daily household objects that we have. It's never going to be a Star Trek replicator, is it? Please say yes. (laughs) Maybe it would be. Maybe it would be. I think our relationship with materials and stuff will change a lot in the future. Aside from the fact that we need to massively reduce the amount of materials that we're extracting and using and putting into the ground, we really need to start creating a a circular materials economy and by that I mean rather than throwing stuff away we need to be able to fix it we need to be able to reuse it to refurbish it and so if a tiny little plastic nugget on your bicycle breaks you don't need to buy a whole new bicycle you can just 3D print that nugget again so what right okay so this is interesting isn't it circular economy because obviously you've got to have plastic to be able to print Mm -hmm. To be able to make the thing, for it to break, and mm-hmm. for it to get put back in. Yeah. So it is literally, we're talking about having to create an economy that works on 100%. As close to 100 re- as we as can. Close, yeah. I, I guess in all systems there's going to be some leakage there. Off, off yeah. Of it, yeah. But, but that's what you're talking about. I mean, there's an interesting economy there. I suppose it's almost like the medieval blacksmith who would remake metals Absolutely. into something else the next time round. So if a sword broke, you might not make a sword. No. Or a fine sword, but you mm. could make a broadsword. Absolutely. But yeah. that, they did that because that steel, that iron, was very valuable. Yeah. The problem that we have today, we can recycle plastics. It's easy, you just melt them a little bit. Yeah. That's cheap, that's easy to do. But we don't do it because plastic to us has no value. And that's what we need to change, is our perceived value of materials. If we change our thinking to think, actually, this plastic has value to me, if I collect enough of it, I could... 3D print myself a sofa or whatever out of that material 
that that's the only way that we can create this circular. It's one of the things driving it's scarcity. It's money. So I mean, you know, I, I'm in my fifties, and as a child, I remember we had bottles of pop delivered and milk delivered, mm-hmm. and the bottles went back. Yep. And actually, we got money back for the bottles. Right. So, so you could steal other people's pot bottles mm-hmm. and take 2p each or whatever you got for them. So even with a value of 2p, but that's they were worth scarce, it. weren't they? Yes. But just giving a value to stuff, it, I think it all comes back to economics. Because do you yeah. remember when we brought in the 5p plastic bag charge? Mm. Plastic bag u- usage in the UK in supermarkets went down at least 80%. Mm. It might even have been more. Now, that's a pure monetary thing. And most of the people that were using those plastic bags could afford 5p. So it wasn't necessarily an economic thing, it was a value judgment thing. I think people resented having to pay for something that used to be free, and so they yeah. avoided paying for it. But you so see, they, they weren't. When bags. I was a kid, you had to buy those. It, it okay. only became free in the 80s. This is oh, the this, Yeah, no, right. no, you won't remember this, because you're only about 15. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, That's really interesting. No, but it is. Yeah. This is what I'm saying. As a very small child, I paid, we, we had value on everything. Right. I mean, the plastic bags were horrible. They were sort of yeah. much thicker. So we need to get back to this idea that all our materials have value. And once we have that, there's lots of schemes. I mean, the plastic bag charge is one example, but I think in Sweden that you can get payback for collecting up plastic bottles and taking those to the supermarkets, and they'll give you cash for that. Now, someone's got to pay for that, and that's really probably the sticking point that we're at at the moment. And it goes far beyond plastics, right? People get upset about plastics in the seas, and I understand why. We also throw away all of our other materials, but because they don't float, we don't get that upset about them. Well, actually, you've just reminded me, we were talking about the plastic bags, how it used to be used to pay for them. When they introduced free ones, what disappeared from supermarkets was the huge pile of cardboard boxes in the corner. I remember that, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Because that actually was there, and you could just go up, find boxes, and people who moved house would go mm-hmm. and get a couple of boxes. I remember that, and, yeah. And it was a second use for the packaging. Yep. So, actually, that's a good thing. Mm, and definitely. it was cardboard, so it would rot, and it would be easily disposed of. Yeah. But that disappeared as well, so the convenience, in a way, got rid of... Mm. It's interesting, isn't it? Do you think artists can help in getting the message across that actually we need to start thinking very carefully about what we make? Where the change will come from is in design. Hmm. So By artists, by the way, I mean art. Yes, yeah, I was yeah, including yeah, designers yeah, yeah, in yeah, yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Maybe that's wrong, but... No, 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 it's not. Design. It's just you can't write a capital A when you say it. No, no, right, exactly, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So what we need is is a redesign in pretty much everything that we use. Yeah. So we need stuff to be, as I said before, repairable. And if, if, if our objects become modular, rather than buying a new TV, if the screen breaks, you just buy a new screen and you can easily remove the old screen and replace it. And you don't have to... Well, it's actually what's happened with cars, isn't it? it? Because of the rise of circuit boards and cars. Yep. Control circuit boards now. People just literally take a circuit board out and put another one in. Yep. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying that's ecologically more sound, but it, it is modular, increasingly. Yeah, and bicycles have always been this yeah. way. Well, they have. They've yeah. always been able to repair just the chain you or bet, just the tyre. You tire. bend your wheel, you go and get another wheel. Yeah. So, I mean, bicycles is a brilliant example of how it's worked. These things are the worst, and I'm waving mm. a mobile phone, a smartphone. I mean, this particular brand won't let you open the thing up. No, and that is um, And disgusting. if you do break it up, you know, it's uh, open it up. You lose your warranty and everything mm. like that on it. So there is a company called Fairphone that are trying to make a modular mobile phone. Unfortunately, it's all right. So we've got. Sorry, some, we're in a maker lab, so there's we've noise. We've got some gas being <laughs> blown around. So Fairphone are trying to make a modular phone. Unfortunately, the performance isn't yet competitive with the main players on the market. But the idea is that, like, as they upgrade, rather than upgrade the whole handset, you can just slot in a new upgrade camera. Upgrade a new camera. A new screen. I mean, screens on phones, you know, they are not well designed. No. But everybody's got a cracked screen. Well, mobile phones is an incredible example of where, of everything that's wrong with our materials attitude, right? Well, I mean, they are. The ultimate dig it up, make something, and you can't deal with it yeah, afterwards. Yeah, and they're designed yeah. to last for two years. Yeah. And then they release a software that makes it stop working, and so you take it into the shop and they say, oh, well, you're doing an upgrade anyway, let's just... Right? 
What happens to a phone when it goes, when you upgrade? Any idea? I have no idea. I think, and don't quote me on this, what I suspect happens is it gets shipped to Malaysia, China, and gets disassembled to a certain extent to extract the precious metals. Yeah. Yeah. But most of it isn't designed to be recycled. So I'd be amazed if more than 5 to 10% was ever recycled. What about organic things when, when you're working with that? So mm. sitting around me here, I'm looking at I'm see, I can see glass, plastic. <laughs> but what about something slightly more organic? So you've got bits of bone, for instance. Yep. Is something like bone recyclable in that sense, is it? Nature recycles pretty much everything, doesn't it? I suppose so, apart from nuclear waste. Apart from nuclear waste. No, it waste, does it, it just does it over long time. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. Half life of several yeah. billion years. Yeah. Nature recycles pretty much everything, and mm. we can learn a lot, I think, from that. There's growing interest in this concept of biomimicry, and lots of artists will be familiar with that, which is mimicking nature in either materials or making processes and structures. So there's an interest now in terms of recycling plastics because how nature recycles stuff is often based on bacteria and little little things eating things bacteria have evolved to eat plastic and there's now an interest in cultivating those bacteria and finding out what the enzymes are that it's doing it and then recreating those enzymes in a big cauldron in the lab and bunging all our plastic in that and recycling it that way but when you say recycle what do they do to it then So these little microbes will come along and inside plastic, all the molecules are big, long chains. Mm -hmm. That's why we call them polymers. And these polymer chains, when the material gets biodegraded, the little microbes come along and they snip those chains. And long polymer chains make plastics that have a high melting point. So you need a lot of heat energy to melt the plastics. Now, shorter polymer chains they make up plastics with lower melting points. So what a little microbe does when it biodegrades plastic is to come along and chop up all those molecules. Now, biodegradable plastics is a big fallacy, I think, in terms of giving the public hope for tackling this problem with plastic waste in our environment. Because what people see is, here's a plastic bag, I'm going to put it under the ground for six months and when I go back I can't see it anymore it's not there it's been biodegraded it's rotten Fine. disappeared it's gone. whatever that's it yeah. actually what's happened is all these little microbes have come along they've snipped up those chains and that plastic has gone from being a solid to being a liquid but it's still plastic and now it's got into your water systems and it's got into your animals and your plants and you've heard a lot well people hear a lot about um, microplastics mm. those are plastics that have been chopped up into little tiny pieces they don't disappear they end up in fish, or they end up in soil. And well, it's a, it's a thing about, about nature and the nature of the universe, isn't it, that you can't actually get rid of anything. It yeah. just changes form. The yeah. first law of thermodynamics. Yeah, well, exactly. Energy can't be created or destroyed, just changed into different things. The same with materials. Mm. These atoms have to go somewhere, Yeah. right? And the only example of them disappearing is nuclear degradation, where the atoms physically oh, where the nucleus change of the into atoms a different falls nucleus. Apart exactly. Changes, yeah. yeah, everything else. The atoms are there, but maybe they're now in a gas and you can't yeah. see it. It's a really complex problem, and there's lots of people doing irresponsible things, in my opinion, trying to make biodegradable plastic bags, for example. When actually what we need to do is not put them in the ground and hope it disappears, but take that plastic, value it, and turn it into something else. What would you think are the most exciting things coming up in your world? Oh, great question. It's a massive question. Mm. Well, apart from this idea of changing the way that we view making in our society, if you take that to its ultimate extreme, there's this technology called claytronics, which is also known as programmable matter, Now, at the moment, it's in its early stages, and it's basically little tiny robots that are like grains of sand, and they can coordinate their position with each other. And so these tiny grains of sand can be programmed to make the shape of a mug or reprogrammed to make the shape of a table. 
by sending them instructions of where to go relative to each other. Wow. And so it's kind of like swarming. It's like, uh, it's, yeah, it's the idea of swarming and like making a shape out of a group. It's like having a, a pile of sand and shapes emerging from exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, so it, the technology's been around for a few years and it's at early stages in terms of the objects and the size of these different individual robots. This is a completely new podcast now. How the <laughs> hell do they communicate on that scale, their sense of position? Well, that's a good question. And I don't know the ins and outs of it. Yeah. But they, it's to do with being like where they are relative to their neighbours. And actually, the problem that they're having in this technology is not making the robots, it's not making them stick together. It's the, the bandwidth, the, the amount of information that you have to send into that tiny yeah. volume... The instructions actually that's kind of that's that's the bottleneck that you can't send enough information into that tiny volume yet you would think you see they'll have done all this i'm just i've never heard of this so this is really interesting but you would think they'd just send like a flocking algorithm to say okay if you're in this space and there's something near you then move together yes i'm sure that that you is know, just basic instruction yeah. set so they need to strip down the instructions to make it as easy as possible but once you have that how we think of objects will completely change because you could have your kitchen table and when you don't like it, instead of buying a new one, you could just reprogram it, re-download a new design and all your little claytronics will form a new design. And it's the same stuff. Or you can make a chair or you could make a weapon or you could make... Whatever you want, Whatever really, you wanted. Yeah. And I mean, this is real sci-fi. It is, but it's, <laughs> but it's in the early stages of happening. And so once we have that, then that's the ultimate reuse, right? As long as these things keep working. I mean, that totally yeah. blows out of the water everything that we think of as materiality, as materials, as stuff. There's a lot of worries that we have to deal with with that because that makes objects hackable. Absolutely, it does. And so you could hack your enemy's table to make a knife or a gun, right? I mean, that's an extreme example. Or a bomb. Or a bot, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Or a rope. I mean, like, all these different yeah, things. Yeah. Like, So I think that's fascinating. And like with 3D printing, when there was this whole thing about, oh, we, anyone can 3D print a gun now without a licence, that, that was quite a big worry a few years ago about, like, the ethics of that, mm. who controls, whose responsibility is it. We'll have that, but now times 100 when when you can make anything from anything. Mm. Got all those things in front of me Fading light I cannot see Got all these years tucked away Once I used them never stay. Well, that's the episode and Richard's interview with Anna Pshysky. She's clearly a fountain of knowledge and a brilliant, witty person. If you do want to find out more about her and what she does, well, here's a few ways. Right, Anna, you're on Twitter. <laughs> I am. You do your stand-ups. Yep. What's your handle on Twitter? It's my name, which is Anna Pozhajski. So it's A-N-N-A-P-L-O-S-Z-A-J-S-K-I. Pozhajski. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I got it right. I've been struggling with the pronunciation. <laughs> no, it's perfect. And how often do you stand up? Um, at the moment... Not that frequently because I'm writing a book, so I'm I'm stripping down the stand-up stuff. But I'm still doing sort of science shows that have got stand-up in them. Um, I'm doing those round and about the place. That's all on my website and my Twitter and stuff. So and Institute of Making. Yeah. If they want to contact you about this through yeah. the website. Yeah, it's just instituteofmaking.org. Institute yeah. of Making dot yeah. org. Yeah. Give it a Google. You'll find us easily on social media as well. There you go. Plus, if you like the sound of her Real Talk podcast, then check that out. She actually interviewed Richard for one episode, so that'd be a great place to start. Aside from that, that's all we have time for in today's episode. Thanks again to Richard and to Anna for being part of it. And to you for listening. If you like what you heard, then why not subscribe to this series so that you can hear more about art and technology. Then, while you're there, if you are able to give us a five-star rating on places like iTunes, then we would really appreciate it, as it helps us to grow our audience. On which topic, we've actually just hit 15,000 listens. 
yeah, which we are incredibly grateful for. It's not a huge number compared to some other shows, but for us, it's a number that we're really proud of. So please keep listening and let others know if you like what you hear. We will be back again next month for another episode of the series. Thank you in the meantime again to those that made the music for the show. The last song was Future Life by Derek Clegg. But until next time, take very good care of yourself. Goodbye.